So Will Jones is the director of the community engagement and outreach at Smart Approaches to Marijuana. He comes from a legacy of civil rights leaders in Washington, DC. He's an experienced speaker and community activist. Um, he works on issues of social justice at the local and national level. He partnered with drug policy advisors and leaders in DC um, in 2014 to found Two is Enough DC to raise awareness of the predatory practices of commercial industries targeting communities of color with substance use and helping to reduce marketing and improve policies that drive the inequities. Um, he's been featured on TV, radio, print outlets, talking about cannabis policy. One of the reasons that uh, we invited him is that so many of our staff and our partners had seen him on various things and really appreciated his perspective. He's been on NBC, Reuters TV, CBS, BBC World, Al Jazeera, C-SPAN, Washington Post, Huff Huffington Post. Um, he's earned an MPA from George Washington University in the School of Public Policy and Administration. And then um, just like all of us, we have lots of different experiences that bring us um, to this room. And he's also a husband and a father and serves as a DC firefighter and EMT. So Mr. Jones, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have you. I invite you to unmute your phone and talk and I'm gonna uh, mute myself. Thanks for that introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be here with you all and share um, share as a keynote speaker. Um, and congratulations to those that are uh, receiving awards this evening for your work in prevention. I think that's such, uh, it's an important field um, and the work that you do is so important. So um, congratulations to you. Um, I'm going to talk about perhaps what may be the next frontier in prevention uh, for you all there in Vermont and definitely in other states. And that has to do with cannabis policy um, in legalization, as I know that's coming to you all, I believe in October of this year. And so I'm gonna give a brief overview of kind of what the field is looking like right now, um, but also specifically focusing on um, how legalization has been impacting uh, minority communities. I know that's one of the things that was discussed in one of the uh, questions earlier this evening about um, advertisements, the level of saturation of advertisements in certain communities. And so that's something that you guys are already aware of. So I just want to help us, I guess, see, you know, as we're celebrating the work that's already been done to also kind of give a preview of maybe how the work may change in the future and just things to be aware of um, in data and trends that are happening um, so that you all can continue to do uh, the great work that you are doing. So let me share my screen. Hope that works. Um, there we go. Um, so again, I'll be focusing um, more narrowly on specifically on the impact of uh, legalization and commercialization in uh, communities of color and the intersection with social justice. But I think there will be some things that will broadly apply just across legalization as well. And we, since we just have 10 minutes, I am going to be going through this faster uh, than I might ordinarily go through it. Um, but my contact information will be at the end and very happy to dig deeper into any one of these slides, um, you know, to follow up with anyone, whether that's by email or phone conversation or even over Zoom, you know, I'm happy to dig deeper on any of the topics that I touched on. Um, so um, when it comes to marijuana legalization, there's three core arguments. And actually, before I get that, just for anyone that's not aware of the organization that I work with, Sam um, here, I'll say we're a bipartisan national organization and we work on issues of marijuana policy at the local and federal level. We provide education as well as working with legislators. Um, and uh, our goal really is to see marijuana policy move forward in a way between the extremes of uh, incarceration and arrests on one hand, I think we've had, we all are aware of some of the harms of just treating substance abuse as a criminal justice issue. Um, but we're also want to avoid the extremes of commercialization on the other hand. And so we're navigating that space in between that um, in ways that can move marijuana policy forward in a way that doesn't negatively impact public health. Um, so back to these three core uh, arguments, and that's arrest and incarceration, business equity initiatives, and reinvesting in communities harmed by war and drugs. Those are the most common uh, topics that I've heard uh, in this space. Uh, again, specifically when we're talking about um, issues of social justice and marijuana legalization. So I wanna analyze these things really quickly, just give a bird's eye view of what's going on in this space, and again, things that we can look out for in the future. Um, I think it's really important though to start out to remember our past and 
not that long ago, in, in all of our lifetimes, in the, in the 90s, um, executives from Big Tobacco, from RJ Reynolds, said stuff like, we don't smoke that shit. We just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. That was their explicit uh, marketing tactics in, um, in our lifetimes. Um, and so we have to be very aware because um, one of the questions that I often pose people, actually, that I always pose people and why I have this slide up is, um, why do we think things will magically change if these same companies are just selling a different product, right? And, and so here you see in these slides, and again, if you do not remember anything else that I say in this presentation, if the rest is kind of boring and droning on, uh, you know, I hope you remember this slide and this question sticks in your mind. Um, but you see here in, in this, um, that's me and my daughter actually a couple of summers ago. Now I went to get her some ice cream at the nearest convenience store to us. Um, and this is what it looks like in 2022. Um, and, uh, you know, the closest store where, where I lived at the time and when I began working on this issue, the closest store to my house in any direction was a liquor store. And so um, I think we need to think honestly, if these companies that you see here and, you know, the pictures behind me are now just selling a different product, why do we believe that they will, um, that anything will change in terms of how they market, who they target, and who has the most negative health impacts from these uh, addictive, um, addictive products? Um, and so we're seeing a lot of similarities between the tobacco and alcohol industries. We're seeing investments from big tobacco industries over uh, nearly $2 billion from Altria, uh, Philip, uh, which is the parent company of Philip Morris. Uh, we've seen investments from the alcohol industry, so uh, Molson Coors, Corona, uh, Blue Moon, Heineken, and others. Um, again, and in, in, this is a very lucrative industry. The Washington Post said that it could bring in more than an NFL if it's legalized at the national level. And so to me, what I see taking place, um, how it appears to me, is that issues of uh, injustice are being appropriated um, by corporations and by businesses that are looking for a way to um, uh, to change the law so that they can, you know, for profit, for their profit. And so, you know, just as an example, this was the campaign that was ran in DC that said legalization ends discrimination. And I always say, if you think that the systemic issues of discrimination and inequality in our country or your state are going to be solved simply by creating a new lucrative industry, you have a naive and very shallow at best understanding of the depth of these issues in the United States and how they persist still in 2022. Um, and in many ways, we see that, you know, history repeating itself again, tobacco companies that not that long ago are partnering with organizations in minority communities. Uh, in this quote from Brown and Williamson, uh, tobacco company is, is really insightful. It said, clearly the sole reason for BMW's interest in the Black and Hispanic communities is the actual and potential sales of BMW products within these communities and the profitability of these sales. This relatively small and often tightly knit minority community can work to BMW's marketing advantage if exploited properly. And I will repeat that last line, if exploited properly. That's what these companies are doing. And they're on the right where you see PACS, um, Marijuana Policy Project and House Plant, making the same types of partnerships, inroads in minority communities um, that tobacco companies did in the past. And this is important, again, if you're a brand like PACS or House Plant or whatnot, you wanna have that instant name recognition, that instant brand recognition uh, in a community with your product. And so we're seeing, again, some of the same patterns take place, unfortunately. Um, these are just some quick images um, on the left. Um, you see Big D Liquors and, and Benning Heights Market. Those were, again, when I began working on this issue, some of the actually the closest stores to my house. Uh, and on the right, we see, you know, some uh, marijuana-related businesses in Colorado. Looks really similar to me, but more importantly, I think is the placement, uh, to, more importantly to be aware of is the placement. Um, they're disproportionately located in communities of color, one pot shop for every 47 residents in Denver, Colorado, more pot shops than Starbucks and McDonald's combined. And so I say, you know, just to paint that picture, imagine you're walking down the road, uh, you see a McDonald's or a Starbucks, replace that with a dispensary, add some more, and that's the level of saturation that we're talking about, particularly in minority communities. 
Um, and so I'm going to breeze through these again. I, I've, I've used up uh, most of the time already, but I want to give just, again, a bird's eye view of what's happening in terms of rest and incarceration in the other two topics. Um, so even the ACLU found that extreme racial disparities in marijuana arrests persist even in legalized or decriminalized states. Um, and what we're seeing is that even though there have been reductions in certain categories of uh, marijuana uh, arrests, um, very specific categories of arrests, marijuana related arrests, the overall rate of uh, arrests of African Americans in Colorado, Denver, and in other states as well has remained unchanged or even gone up in these states since then. And again, to me, this is because there's a systemic underlying issue that is not being addressed. And even if marijuana is legal, if you haven't dealt with those underlying issues, holding people out of force law with bias accountable, um, holding those departments accountable, um, then you're going to have the same issues pop up and just a different excuse. Maybe they'll say, well, it's legal, but you have too much on your person or you're using it in a place where you shouldn't, or there's a whole host of excuses. And I don't want to paint law enforcement with a broad brush, brush either and say that all of them you know, enforce law with bias. But for those that do, they should be held accountable. Legalization does not hold them accountable. And so we see uh, persistent, if not increased bias in arrests, um, depending on, you know, there's multiple ways to interpret this data, but we can just say, again, overall arrests increased. Um, certain on-view on arrests are more likely uh, in Colorado in the years following legalization for, for Blacks uh, than prior to legalization. Um, the juvenile arrest rate, this is very important, school to prison pipeline, because it's still illegal under the age of 21. Minority youth, according to the data, best available data, that was from the Colorado Division of Criminal Justice, um, saw that there was actually, while it did actually drop a small bit for white youth, I think 5%, it increased 35% for Latino youth in 54% for, uh, for Black youth. So just things we got to be aware of moving forward. Um, adult arrests kind of already touched on that. And I, again, I'm not going to dig through all these numbers, but just to show we're tracking them, we're talking about them, and the trends are that even after legalization, that the um, there is no significant decrease in, in arrests, in Black arrests. In Massachusetts here, you see a decrease after 2020, um, that's when COVID hit. So every state across the board saw significant reductions in arrests after when COVID hit. And the same story with the incarcerated population. I know in DC, our prison population was decreasing for several years prior to legalization. Same thing in Colorado. And then for some reason, uh, after legalization, that decrease changed to an increase. I don't have time to fully break down this slide, but just to say there is no state that post legalization in the years following legalization saw any significant uh, reduction in their um, prison populations, while, um, and this is what the second dotted lines are, there actually were some significant reductions in prison populations on legislation that was passed that was actually specifically narrowly targeted at criminal justice reform. So it's an interesting contrast there and why, in my opinion, marijuana legalization is stealing the oxygen from the room from greater reforms that could be done in this space. Um, just California, again, don't have time to break down what's happening there, but just in the, there was a, if you go back here, there was a small bump, not huge, but in 2017, small bump in uh, their prison population, which is right after they legalized, and then it continued on its prior trajectory. Uh, business equity initiatives, um, people, you know, I think this quote from the founder of the um, National Diversity and Inclusion Cannabis Alliance is, is very insightful. And it says people had dreams and hopes of building generational wealth, and it's done just the opposite. It's ruining lives at this point. Um, because these promises of equity are not being upheld nationally, it's still less than 4% ownership by, um, by African Americans in the cannabis industry. Um, you know, even within the medical marijuana industry, which has been around a little bit longer, even in places like New Jersey, where it's been there for 10 years, only one license holder was black. Um, and so there's a lot of concern by people that are excited about legalization, but are seeing, hey, this is actually hurting, not harming, the equity isn't being realized, and people that have made investment, made dreams, um, and things like that um, are really just being left out to dry, and, it, and it's creating um, hurt uh, rather than help. Um, but one other quote I'll just highlight uh, is, time is really up on selling your business dream as a social justice movement. And this is from the president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. And so then again, you see headline after headline after headline repeating the same story that the promises, and, and they sound wonderful. I will be the first to say that these things sound great. But the reality is, again, headline 
headline, 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 and so many more, the, they're not materializing. The systems of inequality are still in place. And so and we're not seeing the promises for equity take place. Uh, just more headlines, again, don't have time to break all of this down, but just to show you that there is so much uh, that's there and that is not being addressed by legalization when it comes to uh, equity initiatives. And then lastly, uh, reinvesting communities harmed by the one drugs. Again, great idea, same kind of concept of though, uh, kind of, I almost call them like campaign promises of legalization, right? And then what actually happens is, um, you know, the racial wealth gap is actually being compounded, not helped. And just to emphasize that point, I have a very short video from Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. Um, and I, I like, it's less than a minute. And I like sharing this video because um, again, for our organization, Sam, this is not a, shouldn't be a partisan issue. Sometimes it is, but it shouldn't be. And so we're looking at what people are saying on both sides of the aisle and then trying to take a step back and say, so what, what are the overall takeaways that we can have from this? So, um, you know, she is an advocate for legalization, but even she is, is, is saying, hey, this is compounding the racial wealth gap, not helping. So I'm going to play that really quick. Let me make sure I have my audio shared, uh, share computer sound, and then I will be done. compounding the racial wealth gap right now um, based on who is getting the first mover advantage. According to an industry trade publication, 73% of cannabis executives in Colorado and Washington are male, 81% are white. In the state of Massachusetts, um, just 3.1% of the marijuana businesses in the state were owned by minorities and just 2.2% were owned by women. Is this industry representative of the communities that have historically bared the greatest brunt of injustice based on the prohibition of marijuana? Absolutely not. It doesn't look like any of the people who are reaping the profits of this uh, are the people who were directly impacted. That is correct. And so, um, again, just wanted to share that to say people on both sides of the aisles are seeing that a lot of these promises aren't painting out. And again, I bring it back to that initial image I showed in question of, you know, why do we think anything's magically going to change just because new corp, you know, sorry, old corporations are selling a new product. Um, we already know how they operate. We know who they harm the most. Um, and you guys work in prevention. So um, I think, you know, we just have to be aware of this new frontier moving forward. Um, this is just a personal side. I always tell people kind of what's my why, why am I motivated to continue working on this issue and be passionate. And when a lot of people tell me, you know, they're like, hey, the train's already left the station. Why are you saying anything? And for me, it's just important to say uh, what my truth is, um, to share that. I have that in my family history. That's my great grandfather and great uncle. They were the first to sit in desegregate schools in Washington, D.C. Um, and I, I draw an interesting contrast on the right there. You have John Boehner, who's now going to make $24 million if marijuana is legalized at the federal level. And I say, you know, there's not always a big paycheck at the end of the day if you're doing the right thing. Um, and yeah, I know you all working in prevention, you would love it too if, if your paycheck for working there in the community was $24 million. Unfortunately, we don't always have that paycheck, but um, the work that you guys are doing is so important and that's uh, something to be proud of. Um, and that's why I continue to speak out on this issue. Um, so that, you know, I can look back and say, hey, I spoke up, I, I shared, I did my best to, to speak the truth um, as, you know, as we're moving into this new frontier of marijuana legalization, commercialization. Um, this is, again, my contact information. So happy to continue the conversation or dig deeper into any of the slides or topics that I went through. I think it went a little bit over, but I hope that was some good information for you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you for your patience with us as we got things going and for doing this and for multitasking through all of it. Um, that was amazing and impressive. And uh, I don't know how long you'll be able to stay on with us. I know you're going to have to jump off, but thank you for coming and for your time today. Um, we really appreciate it.